our resolution of orbifold singularities and Mackay. So the Mackay correspondence. And I'm, uh, uh, so on Saturday I will talk uh, two slightly different topics about the three-dimensional case. So, uh, so this is sort of the aim. I've got G in SLN. And I want to, uh, I, I make Cn divided by G. So the, this G is a, a group of n by n matrices, so it's acting on Cn. Uh, and then I want to make a, re a resolution of this. So if, if possible, I want a crepent resolution. Right, and the Mackay correspondence is quite roughly is saying that uh, the geometry of y, that's assuming a crepent resolution exists, should be equal to, in some vague sense, the equivariant geometry of Cn with G acting on it. <clears throat> so uh, there's, uh, there's a kind of, this can, be, this can be taken in lots and lots of different categories of mathematics, but uh, the Cn, if you think in terms of homotopy theory, then Cn is contractible to a point. And so this is the same as the group acting on the Cn, uh, the group acting on the point, a group acting trivially on a point, and then equivariant geometry just means exactly the representation theory of G. So, uh, in particular, this should say that something like the homology of Y or the cohomology of Y is something to do with the representation of G. Uh, however, uh, you know, this is a, if I, if I just make that statement, this is a very bad statement. I'll come back, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about this. Anyway, on Saturday, I'll talk about uh, n equals 3 and uh, g abelian and this topic which is now called Reed's Recipe. <coughs> so uh, in this case there's sort of quite a successful uh, solution to this problem and it's getting, it gets more and more precise with uh, each uh, each paper that's written on the subject. And, uh, you know, n greater than or equal to 4 are restricted groups. Diagonal groups. So I'll explain, I'll explain what this is. But anyway, today's, uh, today I want to, you know, set the, set the scene and talk about some of the ideas and some of the methods of calculating. So let me start with... Uh, this uh, uh, quite vague historical statement in 1870, and this means within a decade of 1870, Felix Klein uh, classified the groups G in SL2C. Of course, this always means finite. <coughs> so uh, he writes down a list of these groups and studies the quotients uh, C2 divided by G. Right, and I'm, uh, I'm just going to do one case of this in a little bit of detail so that you can see what, uh, what it's about. So I'm going to talk about this group which is called the binary dihedral group of order 4n. Right, and so this, this group is 1 over 2n of 1 and 2n minus 1 extended by 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Yeah, so this is, this is a cyclic group generated by A with uh, A to the 2n equals, equals 1 and this is an element B with uh, B so I, the, the thing that makes it binary is that 
a to the n is b squared is central is really minus 1. So it's the matrix, as a matrix group, a, a to the n is b squared is minus 1. Right? And it's central. So this element necessarily commutes with a and commutes with b. Right? And then if I do b a, I get a b to the minus 1. Have I got this right? I'm sorry. If I do BA, I get uh, uh, A 2N minus 1, B. <coughs> okay, so, but I, 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 don't really want, I don't really want to think of this as an abstract group. I want to think of it as a group acting on C2. So, the quotients, I want to do the quotient in two steps. I want to divide out by the group A, the group generated by A, right? And we know how to do this. So let me write C2 here with coordinates U and V, right? Because I need X and Y for something else, yeah? And so I, I've got U map gets mapped to epsilon times U, where epsilon is X two pi i over n, and v goes to epsilon to the minus one v. Right? So everybody knows what the everybody knows what the invariants of this action are. They are u to the n, u, sorry, u to the two n u v and v to the two n. Yes, and I'm going to think about these guy, this guy B acting on these. So B does B does uh, u to the two n interchanges u and v, and because this power is even here, this minus one doesn't play any part. But uh, but u v gets mapped to minus u v. Right, so. This guy here has determinant one, so when it acts on du wedge dv, if, if I'm thinking it's acting on du wedge dv, this is uh, b invariant. Right, that's what SL2 means, but uv is not. Right, uv gets multiplied by this minus one, so that's what this binary stuff is about. Yes? And so how do I form? I want to form the invariance of the whole group. So guys that invariant under the whole group certainly invariant under A, so there'll be a subring of this. And they've also got to be invariant under B. So how do I find invariance here? Well, uh, you know, you just follow your nose. U to the 2n plus V to the 2n is invariant. And if I do uh, u to the 2n minus v to the 2n, it's not invariant. It gets uh, multiplied by minus 1. And uv both get multiplied by minus 1. Right? And so if I want to find invariance, what I should do is take uh, u squared v squared. That'll be invariant. And uh, uv times u to the 2n minus v to the 2n. And I can also take uh, I could also take u to the 2n minus v to the 2n squared. Right? I'm just taking the invariance of these two guys which are both multiplied by minus 1. So the, the square of each of them and the product of the two of them is. However, we don't need it. This is not needed. Right, because he's al al already in the ring generated by the other guys. Yeah? And so what I do is I call this one Y, and I call, call this one X, and I call this one Z, and I check that X squared is uh, uh, Y squared Z plus Z to some power, and uh, I, I... So it's actually minus 4z to the n plus 1. 
So this is the singularity D n plus 2. <coughs> yes? So, so you know, the, the amazing thing about Cli Klein's classification is that this, this guy here, it's an orbit space of the group, but actually it's isomorphic to a hypersurface in C3. So in every one of these cases, the ring, of the ring of invariance is generated by just three invariant polynomials with one single relation between them. Right, so I get these hypersurfaces. So these hypersurfaces have been studied by many different authors subsequently, especially by Duval in the 1930s and other people after that. Right? And so, you know, the list is AN, DN. So, sorry, I should say the list of groups here is the cyclic group, this binary dihedral that I've just been talking about. And then there are binary uh, tetrahedral, uh, octahedral, and icosahedral. And I'm not going to explain them. They're, they're, they're the binary groups in the sense that they contain a minus one here that's a sort of, you can think of sometimes as projectively as acting trivially, but actually acting by uh, a non-trivial element of the group. Okay, anyway, I'm not going to explain these and, uh, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm, most of what I'm going to say is about, um, is about the abelian groups in any case. So, you know, the... Uh, the, the analysis I was doing here of the invariance is obviously depending on the fact that the group is at least soluble, right? So I, so I worked with the abelian subgroup and then, you know, it's not an abelian group, so I have to do a bit more work after that. So the same sort of thing works the tetrahedral and octahedral group with more and more difficulty as you go on. The icosahedral group contains a simple group, so it has, has a simple group at A5. As a, as a Z2 quotient. So, um, it, it, in principle, it, the same ideas don't, don't really work. But nevertheless, Klein wrote down the, the invariance, right? So, the, um, the corresponding Duval singularities... Uh, so, if, if it's a cyclic group 1 over R1 one minus 1, this corresponds to An, which is xy equal z to the... Uh, n plus 1. And, uh, you know, n and r are related in some way that you can figure out. And this binary dihedral group 4n is related to d, and again, it's dn plus, it happens to be dn plus 2. <coughs> so x squared equals y squared z, and n plus, you know, some, some constant which really doesn't matter at all, z to the n plus 1. Uh, e6, e7, e8, <coughs> corresponding to these groups. Right. So there are lots of different places, including my lecture notes, where these things are written out. So, um, <coughs> so uh, everybody knows that these are hypersurface singularities, and I can resolve these, these singularities. Uh, so the singularity is x in C3 by, by blow-ups, and the blow-ups are, I, I, this is an isolated double point of a hypersurface, so if I blow it up once, it remains only with only isolated double points. Anyway, and that's so I get y goes to x. And the exceptional locus here, exceptional curves, are uh, a bunch of minus 1 curves, a bunch of minus 2 curves. So let me just draw this d in plus 2 case. <coughs> uh, this... Uh, Subscript always refers to the number of curves that appear in the resolution. <coughs> and so this is, the, uh, this is the minimal resolution, and it has the property that Ky is the pullback of Kx. 
So this is called Crepant in the higher dimensional literature. Yes. <clears throat> and so let's go, let's go to this uh, Mackay observation. Mackay, so this is around 1980, says the following, that let's look at our rep representations of the group G. So the group G is still this finite subgroup in SL2, one of these uh, classes of groups that we, I've been talking about. Right? And he says that these correspond one-to-one -one with the irreducible uh, so, so, sorry, the ir irreducible representations minus the trivial representation <coughs> correspond to the irreducible curves, exceptional curves. Let's, let's just say exceptional curves of the resolution. Okay? So let me just uh, let, let me explain what this means in this case. So if I think about this, this binary dihedral group, right, it so happens it has, it has a n minus 1 rank 2 rep irreducible representations. Right, and it has 4 rank 1 representations. Right, so let me let me call Q is C two with the with the group G acting on it because the group G is in the group G is in SL two. Right, so that's the group with uh, mate, so A B act by star. Yeah. And so these n minus 1 irreducible representations look like this. So let me write vi. So this looks like A acts by uh, 1 over um, 2n of epsilon i, epsilon to the minus i. So it's the same as this except that there's a Okay, okay, I shouldn't be. I'm mixing notation. And uh, B acts by uh, 0, 1, minus 1 to the power of I. Yeah, and so. So there are two different eigenvalues here. So this i is 1 up to n minus 1. Right? And so these, uh, in, within this range, these two, different, uh, these two eigenvalues are, are different. Right? And then the, the, two, the two eigenspaces of a get mixed up by b. So this is an irreducible representation. Okay, so the other, and then there are these uh, representations here where uh, the rank one, the rank one A and B act by plus or minus one. And I'm not going to explain this anymore. I mean, if you want to understand it, you just do a few calculations. Yeah? <coughs> so, uh, Mackay has this other idea, which is to say we go from the set of representations to the quiver of representations. So a quiver in English is a, is a tube full of arrows. So this is a quiver, it's a set of arrows. So, you know, there was a time when uh, 
Every Englishman carried a bow and arrow in case he met a Frenchman. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, so it goes back to these days. I don't think I've ever shot an arrow in uh, anger. <coughs> so uh, uh, what we do here is well, I'm going to write row, uh, row uh, let me write I, it's not the same I, uh, for re ir irreducible representations irreducible representations of G. And then I'm going to write row I maps to row J if if uh, row J is contained in, uh, contained as a direct sum and in Q tensor row I. Right, so I mean formally I could write uh, I, I can take rho i tensor q, and I can write this as sum of a i j, uh, rho j, and write a i j arrows. Right. However, this a i j is always either equals zero or one, and so what I wrote above there is true. Yes. And so you know the thing that happens here is. So, suppose I, if I start with a trivial representation and I tensor with Q, I get Q, which is the same as V1. Right? And it so happens, if I take the minus 1 representation, so that's where A and B are AX by plus 1 and BX by minus 1, then it but it also happens that minus one tensor, tensor Q, minus one tensor this representation is also isomorphic to Q. So I get an arrow like that. Anyway, the, it, this continues like this, V2, V3, up to Vn minus one. And then, so, you know, if I, if I, put, if I put N here, if you think about acting by n, then this is minus 1, minus 1, right? So if u acts by minus 1, if, uh, if, if, the, if a acts by minus 1 on both of these, then the thing gets split up into two irreducible representations. So that's what these two guys are here. So there's an L plus and an L minus. <coughs> yes? And what's happening here is that if I do V1, VI tensor Q, this is isomorphic to vi minus 1 plus vi plus 1. If I'm, if I'm somewhere in the middle of the graph here, right, I'm just saying I have this arrangement where a multiplies by epsilon to i and epsilon to minus i, and then I'm tensoring it with this q where it's the same with plus 1 and minus 1. Right, so either the plus, either the plus, and, either the plus, it, plus i and plus 1 are coordinated, in which case I'm going to the VI plus 1, or they're pulling in the opposite direction, and then it's uh, VI minus 1. Right? So this picture is sort of very simple. It's telling me that I have this quiver. Right? And I'm, uh, it's, uh, it, it, each of these arrows is doubled. Right? So each arrow, each arrow of the Dinkin diagram is doubled. Right? So let me just explain why this is and what, what this is about. So this is just saying if I've got rho and I do rho tensor q and then I do rho tensor q again, right, then this guy here, q, this certainly contains wedge 2 of q. Right? And, and because this is the group is in SL2, this is the trivial representation. Yeah? And so therefore, if I, go, if, I, if I do this tensoring with Q and then splitting up, so I'm going forwards and splitting up, and then going backwards and splitting up, then somewhere in there, uh, so I'm going forwards and splitting up, and then I'm going in all possible directions from there and splitting up again, then one of these arrows is certainly pointing back to the, to the original row. Right? So this, uh, this doubling up of the arrows... is characteristic of 
of SL2. Right. So in SL in SL3, for example, you get these characteristic triangles, right, for exactly the same reason. So, so uh, ignore this until Saturday, but on uh, Saturday there will be lots of these. Yes? And so, uh, and so Mackay is just looking at this, you know, he, he does, uh, he does, uh, he's just doing representation theory of finite group, and he says, let's take one of these groups, let's consider this uh, set of irreducible representations, and let's add the structure of a, the quiver, it's called the Mackay quiver, right, and the picture we get, if you exclude the trivial representation, is just the, uh, these Dinkin diagrams, a n, d n, exactly these Dinkin diagrams here, in, the, in the, all the cases, right? And the Dinkin diagram sort of messed around with these double arrows for some reason, which, uh, well, I mean, I explained, but uh, uh, it sort of makes things a bit messy. Okay? So, uh, Mackay's observation, this is purely in group theory. There's no geometry here. There's absolutely no relation with the uh, uh, resolution of singularities, except the observation that the two two sets of combinatorics coincide. So, uh, when an algebraic geometer hears this, they want to know that there is a kind of organic connection between the rep representation theory of the group and the resolution of singularities. So I'm going to offer a digression quite soon uh, and talk about uh, general things about moduli spaces, but let me, uh, let me just say where this starts from. So uh, we, want, we want to put in some geometry Right. And so this was, uh, uh, in this form is Verdier and Gonzalez Springberg. <coughs> uh, so, so this is, I, I don't know, around 1980. And so they, uh, what, they, what they observe is they take the C2, the C2 with the G acting on it. And it's going down to this quotient, C2 over G, which I'm going to call X. And then it's getting resolved here, Y. So this is a minimal resolution. So they observe that why uh, it, one can go from irreducible representation of G to, so let me call this rho, to a vector bundle F rho on Y. Yes, and so this is, uh, uh, you know, tautologically, I, I, I'll come back to this several times. So the F is, F is defined here in a tautological way, just from the construction of Y. <coughs> yes, and, and then uh, if I look at the first Chern class, of these bundles, F rho. So these are certain classes in H upper 2 of Y and uh, coefficient <coughs> of Z. So these are, these are dual to the basis C 
uh, sorry, E i in H lower to y z. Okay, so so I'm thinking of this as being uh, a surface, which is a, a retract, a, a homotopy retract of this finite set of curves here. So the curves C i. So if I have a curve here, I can think of it as uh, giving a, a homology class. So this is just the homology class made up by tri triangulating the CI, if you want to think in those terms. Right? And so what, so what I have here is uh, there's some way of numbering these rows and these I's so that uh, uh, the first term class of F row evaluated on, so the degree of this guy here, evaluated on EI is 1 or 0. Right, so this is a kind of, if I numbered these correctly, this would be delta IJ. That's a Kronecker delta I rho. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being sloppy after numbering, after numbering the curves. Yes? And so this is definitely geometry, right? We're starting off with, I'm starting off with uh, the irreducible representation of G here, and I'm doing something to it that pulls out here a vector bundle on the resolution. And then the vector bundle has degree one on one of the curves, so it marks one of the curves. So here, I've got these curves here. Then I've got this vector bundle here, and it's got degree one here, and zero everywhere else. Right, so the, these, vec these irreducible representations, rho here, mark the curves one, one, one by one. And that sort of recovers, uh, this recovers uh, the uh, Mackay quiver. Uh, this re recovers the Mackay one-to-one uh, um, -one correspondence. Okay, so of course I mean non-trivial. Right, if I take the trivial bundle, the trivial representation, then either I don't get anything at all or I get just the trivial, bun the trivial vector bundle here and that can't mark anything. Yes? So, uh, let, me, let, me, let me give an example. Let, let me... Uh, if I take, I, I'm, I'm going to mainly be concerned with the cyclic groups. So let me just do the cyclic group in the, in the so this is going down to uh, x, x equals u to the r, y equals u, v, z equals v to the r, these are the invariants, and x, z equals y to the power of r. Right. So it turns out that when everybody knows how to make the resolution of singularities. I'm going to be drawing this, this diagram later. Each of these guys here, you can think of it as being parametrized by uh, so you can think of these guys as being parametrized by u to the power of i ratio v to the power of r minus i. Right? And so, there's a kind of uh, central mystery here. Well, let, let, let me come, come back to this. But this ratio is the same thing as the ratio uh, x to y to the power of i, or possibly r minus i or something, which is equal to y to the r minus i to z. Yeah? So, 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 so let, me, let me just say this again. I've got C2 here. I'm mapping down to X, which is C2, divided by this group action. So this is in C3 with this X, Y, Z. Okay? So, you know, the, after I've divided out by the group action, there isn't any more group here. So you, you might think, I've got this X and... I've, I've got this x, 
and if I resolve the singularities, then I've got a surface here, and you know I've already factored out by the group, so the group is not doing anything at all. Right? However, this singularity has a class group, so I'm, I'm writing down here divisors on uh, uh, if, 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 I, if I choose this ratio, I'm writing down a divisor on X in a certain divisor class, so the local the class group of X is uh, Z mod R, generated by uh, these eigensheaves. Uh, 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 let, let me come to these. Right? And uh, this... Um, so if I write down this x, x, y to the i, and then y to the r minus i to z, right? These, these, this ratio here is equal to this ratio here because of this equivalence, right? And it's also of this form, right? So, so the thing that you notice about this is that it involves quantities coming from the C2. So this ratio u to the i, v to the r minus i doesn't make sense on x. Right, these, the left-hand side and the right-hand side here don't make sense on X. They're not functions on X. They're functions on C2. But these are two functions in the same eigenspace of the group action. Yeah, so the ratio of them is, uh, uh, is an invariant function on X. Right? And it's this, this function here is providing coordinates along this P1. So the, the, there's a corresponding line bundle here generated by u to the i and v to the r minus i or generated by these two ratios. And, and this is O of 1 on this curve and trivial on all the other curves. Right? So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not doing this formally, but... Uh, um, this is some kind of explanation of what, this, what, what those guys are doing. So, um, <coughs> so the next step is really due to uh, Nakamura. So this is uh, Iku Nakamura of Hokkaido University. Uh, and uh, Nakamura and Yukari Ito. <coughs> and so, so Na Nakamura says this thing, which uh, at the beginning nobody believed, and now is... Uh, so the standard idea, ideology. Right. This is a fine moduli space of G clusters. Right. So I'm, go I'm going to explain this. So I'm going to... So the point about this is that The point about this is, uh, if, I, if I take the quotient of C2 by x, then x is a surface. And I can think of it just as a variety in its own way, just as a scheme. I can completely forget that it comes from a group. And then I can resolve the singularities. And then this resolution of the singularities is some kind of blow-ups of x, right? And it's got nothing at all to do with the group action. So Nakamura is saying something quite different. He's saying, let's think of y as being a moduli space on C2. Right? And when something is a moduli space, it means, the, it means it parametrizes something. And the things it parametrizes have a character all of their own. Right? And, so, and so this idea, this idea recovers the uh, Verdier, Gonzalez, Springberg, uh, <coughs> Tautological bundles as part of the tautological apparatus uh, 
of moduli, moduli problems. Right. So this is, uh, this is sort of taking us into a different world. This is taking us into a world of moduli where uh, there are, you know, there are methods all of its own, where there are, you know, methods and methods of argument and results to some extent. Okay, so, so I'm going to explain, I'm going to explain this because it's a point of principle. Right, but first of all I better explain what this, uh, what these G clusters are. So, <coughs> so, uh, so this, this is definitions. So G cluster. So this, what, what this is, is, so I've got G is acting on manifold, in this case C. Let me, let me say Cn. Right, it'll be, it's C2 in the present case, it'll be C3 on Saturday, and then higher, higher Cn uh, also on Saturday. Right? And so a, a G cluster is a zero dimensional scheme. Z. Right? So it means Z is contained in Cn. And I want it to be G invariant. And I want it to have length, length of Z, which is the dimension over C of H naught of OZ, is the order of G. And whilst I'm about, I'm going to fix, I want, so, so the point is G is acting on this Z, right? And so I want H naught of OZ is isomorphic, isomorphic to uh, the regular representation of G as a G module. So I'm going to do a few examples of this later, but uh, let, let's just, uh, let, let me just, let, let, let me just say what, what this is about. So, uh, example, this is a sort of primary fundamental example. So, if I've got a general point, P, P in Cn, right, a gen general, then G dot P, the orbit of P, is a set of G points. Just permuted around by the group action. So I have G, I have, you know, GP, I have a uh, I have an orbit of points here, no fixed points. So G distinct points. Right? And the group is just acting on it by permuting the points. Right? And it's permuting them by left action on G. When G acts on this GP, it's just acting on them by... So if I take the set of functions on this, if I take Z is GP as a subscheme of CN, Right? Then H naught of OZ is the regular representation. Right? It's one copy of, the, of C for each element of the group, and the group just is just permuting them by left, by left multiplication on itself. Yeah? So this is called a free orbit. So uh, the problem is, what happens when, what happens when this point, what, what happens when this point tends towards a fixed point of some element of the group? What, what happens when the point P tends to the origin, which is fixed by everything in the group? And so then, at the origin, so when the point comes into the origin, right? Then there's a scheme Z, which records all kinds of complicated information here about the scheme structure there. So, so we'll, we'll see a few examples of this later. Okay. So I want, to, I want to briefly, just very briefly say what the point of this, of this moduli, you know, I said the moduli, so this is a digression. 
on moduli spaces. So if, uh, if I've got M a manifold, that parameterizes some geometric objects. Right? So I want, I, I want to think of the set of all of these things, or later on make it in, not just into a set, but into a variety, into a scheme, right? then uh, it means the point P in there corresponds to some, uh, let's say, geometric object Z, then the P corresponds to ZP. Right? So a point of a manifold is just a point. I mean, it uh, sort of basically has no character, no structure, no anything. Whereas the thing on the right there, the ZP, might have lots and lots of individual character. And so uh, by saying that your space is a moduli space, you get a lot of information about M itself. Right? So if M is a moduli space, right, means uh, M has lots of structure coming from the, the, the character of the of the ZP. Okay? So, so look, this is an important this is an important principle, something that I think algebraic geometers, we algebraic geometers learnt from David Mumford a long time ago. And really the key point here, the, 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 a key example is uh, a key example is uh, you know, and a key and a very simple example is M is a Grassmannian. So, so let me write Grassmannian of R and N. Right? And so here, here I've got CN and a point, a point P in there corresponds to C R sub P in there. Yeah? And, uh, you know, you can do all kinds of things with this. You can do the Plucker embedding, you can uh, say what the affine, affine coordinate charts are and so on. Right? And so, because it's a moduli space, uh, it inherits tautological Uh, so in this case, they're tautological vector bundles. Right? So, so I need to go a little bit fast here, but uh, here's my M, and here is CN. So I really want to think of linear forms on CN. So, you know, if you want to write CN dual, that's fine. Right? And I can take, at each point P, I can take this CN linear forms and restrict to this CRP, restrict to this particular, and that defines here, so it defines a vector bundle here, E, rank P of rank R, right, and this is just the linear this is the linear forms on this CR, CRP, right? And there's a kernel, uh, there's a kernel here, which let, let me write F, okay? So, the, this, by virtue of the fact it's a moduli space, it supports this Tautological information. Tautological means having no content. Means completely trivial, completely uh, vacuously true. Right? So because this guy M parameterizes subspaces here, then on M there is this information here, which is tautological information. Right? And this tautological information here is very, very strong. It tells you everything you want to know about the geometry of M. So, 
So, so let me notice, E is a rank R bundle, and it's generated, globally generated, by N linearly independent uh, sections. And it's generated by N global sections. Right, so nothing surprising about this. This E here is just linear forms of Cn restricted to CPR. So of course every linear form on CP gives you a, a linear form on each of the bundles. Yes? So this is a rank R bundle generated by N global sections. Moreover, this M is universal for this property. In other words, if I've got a scheme S and I've got a rank R vector bundle on it that's generated by N global sections, then there is a morphism to M and the information on the scheme S comes by pulling back the information from M. Right? So, so this represents the functor of so E S over S generated rank R generated by N sections. Every, every, every guy of this is, every one of this kind is obtained by pulling back this information over M by unique morphism. Right, so this has a universal property with this. Okay, and the point, the, the point I want to make here is this tells us, this tells us completely the information about the geometry of M. Right, uh, I don't want to move to a different blackboard for the camera. So let me just write here. A consequence of this is the uh, we get the cohomology ring of M is generated by the churn classes churn classes of E, churn classes of F with tautological relations. Right, and so the total, the to, this is, the thing I'm saying is very, very ele elementary stuff about Grassmannians. However, exactly all of that's going to apply to this uh, Gonzalez-Springberg situation as well. So in other words, write C1, C2 up to CR for the churn classes of E, this is the rank R bundle, and rank, write D1, D2 up to D, N minus R for the churn classes of F, N minus R. Right. Then there is a relation that holds, which is saying 1 plus C1 plus, plus CR times 1 plus D1 plus, plus DR minus 1, N minus R equals 1. So, so this, this bundle here is, in K theory, is the direct sum of F and E. And so the, the, the product of tensor, the product of ch total churn classes is 1. Right? And the thing I've just written down here is these are generators and relations for the cohomology ring of, F, of M, or for the chow, chow ring of M if you want to work in algebraic geometry. Right? And so, you know, you know, the point is, to just by being a moduli space, you get a lot of information for free. <coughs> right? And we want to do the same with this, uh, with this Mackay, in this Mackay setup. Ah. Uh. So, um, so, so let me go back to this CN G-acting. I'm going to a quotient 
x, and if possible, I'm going to go to resolution y. Right? And so let's call this map pi, and let's write down, so, you know, I'm really thinking of this as spec of polynomial ring, maybe u1 up to un, and this is spec of uh, u1 up to un, invariant under g. Right? So I'm going to use the, I'm going to use sort of geometric language, pi lower star o c n as a, as O X module, but it just really means take this guy here, corresponding to C N, and think of, him, think of him as a module over this, over this ring. Yes. So this splits according to representations of G. So it splits in the form. Uh, let me try and get it right, uh, F rho tensor rho. So this is pi lower star of O C N is a direct sum of these uh, character sheaves, eigen sheaves. Uh, so I'm going to call these F primed. Right, so who is F rho? Well, F rho is just Um, I may be sorry that I started on this in, in, with these words. I want this to be a hum o hum 